FDI in space. Yes, you have heard it right, read it right, and we are going to discuss about it also. So, has India allowed FDI in the space sector also? Or what is the situation of agricultural households in India at present? Or do you know that the northernmost island has been discovered in the world right now? So all of these are there for you. And apart from this, there are other questions as well that are important for your upcoming RBI SEBI examinations. So let's begin this video. But before that, if you haven't subscribed our channel, guys, then do subscribe the channel. And you can also join the Telegram group because there you will get the PDF of this session. So let's quickly begin this session and those who have examination today all the best to you guys do good and crack the examination those who have exam today as well as tomorrow. So all my good wishes are with you I hope that you all clear the examination and more, I hope that majority of the questions come from the areas that you have studied okay so good luck prepare hard i hope that you all have prepared hard do good in the exam okay and don't be nervous okay so this is our first question which entity has signed an mou with isro for accessing isro facilities and technical expertise for testing its own own space launch vehicle systems and subsystems so guys this question has nothing to do with the FDI in the space sector. However, when the announcement was made by K. Shivan, who is the chairman of ISRO and the secretary of department of space, this MOU was also signed. So it is important for you to know that as well. So with which company has ISRO signed this framework agreement to allow that company use ISRO's expertise and facilities in launching their own satellite launch vehicles and satellites? The right answer here is Skyroot Aerospace Private Limited. With this organization, this MOU has been recently signed. Now, first of all, the very first thing that I want to make clear here is that FDI in the space sector has not been allowed yet. It is the contention that the government is working on. The government is planning to allow FDI in the space sector and this is what uh, the ISRO chairman K. Shivan announced at an event that was organized by Confederation of Indian Industry. So that is the all news. But do remember that FDI in the space, space sector has not been allowed yet. It is just the contention. It is the proposal that the government is working on. Okay. So this we have already studied that what this MOU uh, for and do remember the sky route is located in Hyderabad. Now the event that I was talking about is this International Space Conference and Exhibition. Now guys it had a theme and that theme is building new space in India. So on this theme CII organized this international space conference and ex exhibition where the ISRO chairman K. Shivan announced that India is planning to in, uh, open up the FDI in the space sector as India has already opened up the sector for the private companies in India. Okay. So that is the uh, whole news. Now this is the survey uh, launched by National Statistics Office and this survey is very important for your ESI point of view, for your GK point of view and also uh, it can also be asked in your ARD if you are appearing for the phase 2, if you clear your phase 2, uh, phase 1 examination. How much is the average monthly income per agricultural household as per the NSO 77th round of survey report? Now this is the 77th round of survey in which during that survey a report which has a specific title and that title I must say is very long. So we will be looking at the title as well but let's first understand what does this mean. Okay, so this means that the survey was conducted but during that survey so this uh, during that survey a report was released and that report states about the situation of agricultural households in India. Okay, so let's first 
have the answer of this question then we will understand the premise of this report and then we will dive down into the report itself so here the right answer is rupees 10218 this is the average monthly income of an average rural agricultural household the very first thing that i want to make clear here is that agricultural rural households okay have a particular definition in this report so this report defines what comprise an agricultural household so we will be looking into the definition but let's first understand the premise of this report the very first thing is that this report is purely a report of facts here you will have a lot of numbers that you will have to mug up okay so i must say that there is no conceptual understanding as such but if you look at the numbers carefully you can find some of the concepts okay for example this report states about the total number of agricultural households in india okay what is the average income of an average agricultural household in india in rural india obviously agriculture is uh, done in the rural india so it's useless to mention the rural again and again okay so income of the average agricultural household then how much land does an average rural household okay hold or possess so how much is the possession of land by an average uh, agricultural household now this is important guys because possession of land will help in achieving the target of doubling of farmers income possession of land the more the the more land the more income for the farmers okay so this will also lead to the increasing wealth as well as prosperity of the farmer so if you look at the numbers that how much land do the farmers an average agricultural household possess then you will understand that how much the government has achieved in doubling the farmers of income as well as in the increasing the prosperity of the farmers or the agricultural households in general then this report also states about the loans how much loan does an ag average agricultural household has taken in india in 2018 to 19 so that is the uh, that is the tenure of this report okay so what is the uh, average loan that the person has taken that the agricultural household has taken that is not very important but the thing that is important is the channel from where he is taking the loan is it the formal credit or is it from the money lenders and you would i guess you would not be shocked because still money lenders exist in india and a lot of farmers are taking loans from the money lenders so this states as per this report this states that since or even now the access to the formal credit is not wide okay is not widespread in india so these are some of the premises these are some of the dimensions on which this report is provided or is providing the information i have divided the information in these segments okay now guys the other thing that you need to pay attention to is that this report is comparing the data between these two tenures okay so the tenure of this report is 2018 to 19 but the comparison is made with the figures of 2012 to 30 okay you will understand this thing when we come into the details of this report okay the very first thing is the name of this report so this is the long name situation assessment of agricultural households and land and livestock holdings of households in rural india 2019 report this report was prepared as part of the 77th round of survey and the tenure of this report is this so data was collected during this period but the data belongs to 2018 to 19 okay 
Now, the very first thing that we need to know if we want to cover this report is the definition. What do uh, they have, what uh, do the NSO have put in the definition of agricultural household? So, agricultural household is defined as a household receiving more than 400 rupees from the agricultural activities. 4000, sorry as value of produce from the agricultural activities and have at least one member self-employed in agriculture either in the principal status or in subsidiary status in during the last 365 days okay so 4000 is the amount that you should be deriving from the agricultural produce and one member from your household should be partly or fully employed in the agriculture this is what the definition means of an agricultural household now what are the things or what are the uh, components that have been kept out from this definition so the components are agricultural labor households that are entirely labor that are entirely engaged in the agricultural labor here the word self-employed is mentioned okay next coastal fishing rural artisans agricultural services so they do not comprise agricultural household if anyone from the household is engaged in any of these activities the entire household is engaged in any of these activities then they would not come under the agricultural household category and they are not judged or assessed in this report i hope that this much is clear to you now we will we will be having a quick look at the facts at the numbers the total number of agricultural households so the total number is 9.3 crores out of them 45.8 percent are obcs 15.9 percent are scs 14.2 percent are sts and 24.1 percent are others not at all an important figure from your phase one point of view non-agricultural households living in the rural area were 7.93 crores income so the average monthly income per agricultural household during the agricultural year 2018 to 19 was this 10,218 rupees which is a 59 percent increase compared to rupees 6,426 in 2012 to 13 so this is one parameter where the government has stand out okay in terms of its promises doubling the farmers income by 2022 so this is almost the double Ashok Dalwai was the committee that represented the report on doubling the farmer's income. Okay, so this is almost double and we still have one year left in doubling the income of farmers. This is what this report says. Farm income doubled to 4,063 rupees in 2018 to 19 in comparison to this due to higher monthly wages. So the next parameter is loans. Over 50% of the agricultural loans, sorry, 50% of the agricultural households in India were in debt and the amount, the average amount taken as a debt by the agricultural household stands at Rs. 74,121. Only 69.6% of the outstanding loans were taken from the institutional sources whereas 20.5% agricultural households still relied on the informal sources like money lenders. So this highlights this again indicates the increase to need the uh, basically the need to increase the access to formal credit uh, to these uh, agricultural households okay the next parameter is possession of land almost 83.5 percent of rural households had one had less than one hectare of land while only 0.2 percent possessed land in excess of 10 hectares so this is the sad reality in terms of land possession uh, in the case of agricultural households. Of the 28 states that were assessed in this report, 11 states reported higher uh, average outstanding loan per household than the national average. So farmers or agricultural households in these states had a higher outstanding loan in comparison to the national average. 
द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज वर्ल्ड नॉर्दर्न मोस्ट आईलैंड इज क्लोजेस्ट टू विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग कंट्रीज द राइट आंसर इज डेनमार्क नाउ गाइज इफ यू सी इट पॉलिटिकली इन टर्म्स ऑफ कंट्रीज देन डेनमार्क इज द राइट आंसर बट जियोग्राफी जोग्राफिकली ग्रीनलैंड इज द राइट आंसर नाउ डेनमार्क इज ग्रीनलैंड इज एन ऑटोनोमस territory under the administration of denmark only so politically if you see the countries because the question is asking you about the countries not about the island okay so if you see the country so denmark would be the right answer but geographically the new island is located above greenland and you can see this is canada and this is europe okay so there is a huge difference between the island's location and denmark and denmark is not at all in the northern most region okay so this is the basic difference quad leaders summit which country is going to host that so it is going to be hosted by us at washington dc prime minister narendra modi has also visited us for this basically he is going to visit us for uh, this quad leaders summit and a day after this summit there would be unga united nation general assembly's summit which would be the 76th session of that assembly and the president is abdullah shahid do remember his name he is the president of the unga's 76th session now your question is you have to tell me in which year was the was the quadrilateral security dialogue established okay so this is your question Recently RBI has announced to link UPI with PayNow systems to facilitate international payments which country does the PayNow belong to Singapore Japan Bhutan Nepal Indonesia are the right uh, are in the options the right answer is Singapore so by linking the PayNow PayNow is basically a digital payment platform of Singapore which is owned by the association of banks in Singapore so by linking the pay now system with upi upi we all know what upi is by linking both of these systems the transactions from one country between india and singapore will be easy so in order to boost the ease of doing business as well as facilitate more transactions between india and singapore this linking has been done by rbi and singapore's uh, this platform pay now okay so complete linking will be done by july 2022 Which of the following is India's largest licensed non-fungible tokens platform? The right answer is Collection. Now, non-fungible uh, tokens are basically the digital assets. For example, you have a music video. So, if you convert that music video into an NFT by uploading it on blockchain, then you would be able to trade it. You can sell your music video to the another person for a limited or fixed amount of. money okay understood now what is the benefit of trading in nft why would the purchaser the buyer buy that token from you buy that asset from you the reason is the uniqueness of that thing unique uniqueness of the token okay if i have a painting why would i uh, purchase that painting or uh, why would the other person buy that painting because of its uniqueness and these nfts cannot be duplicated therefore they are sold at a high amount at the platforms like collegian okay collegian when is the united nations day for south south cooperation observed september 12 is the right answer and there was no theme for this day in 2021 now guys let me tell you what the south south cooperation is so the developing countries in the global south okay by global south i do not mean the global southern hemisphere okay the countries which are developing and majorly majority of these countries are located in this southern hemisphere for example you have latin american countries all of them are developing countries you have caribbean island countries as well you have uh, uh, you have african countries middle east countries asian countries like india china mongolia and you have uh, the southeast asian countries so all of these countries uh, the countries located in these regions are do, uh, are the 
developing countries and in order to promote cooperation among themselves they have established this south south cooperation now the united nations office for south south cooperation came into effect in 1978 okay do remember now let's have a look at this g7 as well which was also formed to promote cooperation among the developing countries but you need to question yourself is this g7 an outshoot or an offshoot of this south south cooperation guys you can say it in theoretical terms but if you uh, look at it in technical terms then g7 has nothing to do with the south south cooperation g7 is a grouping that was founded by 77 countries in order to promote techni uh, technical cooperation and other kinds of cooperation among them for the for their development okay so g7 however all the member countries of g7 are developing nations so theoretically or ideologically both g7 and the south south cooperation framework are on the same lines now let us have a look at the facts related to g7 1964 is the year of establishment of g7 whereas the united nations office for south south cooperation was established in 1978 okay so this was very uh, this was much later than the establishment of g7 itself founding members were 77 nations and right now 134 countries are members new york is the headquarter republic of guinea is the present chair of this g7 grouping now guys as we have certain framework certain charter convention treaty whatever you may call it for the establishment for preparing the groundwork for establishment of an international organization similarly we have a special charter for the establishment of g7 you have to name that charter okay in the comment section below so that was all for today i hope that you have liked the video and if you have then do not forget to subscribe the channel and like this video thank you so much